Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am Cosmi Costinage, director of Parasite, and together with Mimi Brown, uh, founder and director of Spring Workshops, it is our pleasure to welcome you uh, at uh, tonight's program, which is the last in a series of performances cur curated by Tang Fu Kun uh, in the framework of the Taiping Tianguo exhibition, which officially ends tonight. Um, so after the uh, performances of Melati Surya Dormo and uh, Zania Mashita from uh, last Sunday at uh, Spring, it is our great honor to welcome one of the seminal figures of contemporary dance and one of the um, founding figures of what we call uh, contemporary dance today, Savio Leroy, uh, with um, uh, the piece that we will see, Product of Circumstances from 1999, which is uh, in many ways uh, referencing the history of dance. Um, before we start, I would also like to uh, uh, say a few words about the significance of this piece uh, in this particular framework, because when, together with Dorian Chong, the co-curator of the Taiping Tianguo exhibition, we invited uh, Fu Kun to um, intervene in our curatorial narrative and in the stories that, um, that the, exhibitions were, 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 were the exhibition were presenting, uh, he came out with uh, these three wonderful proposals. And the piece that we will see tonight, Product of Circumstances, um, is a major contribution to our curatorial narrative because besides the many intentions of the exhibition, including the very art historical ones of recontextualizing the works of the, of the four artists and of uh, trying to perhaps put under question the um, basis and the frameworks in which uh, Chinese contemporary art is written, we also had a more um, universal intention with the exhibition and to um, understand how uh, artists become artists and what sort of biographical uh, data contribute to uh, this very complex formation of, uh, of an artist practice. Um, and the piece that you will see tonight, I think, is, uh, um, can also be considered you know, a an, an very interesting response to that, or, or, or the way, or, or, or seeing it in this context would be, uh, is doing a great benefit to uh, understanding this uh, um, this intention with the exhibition, which again was also more universal and not just uh, circumscribed to a Chinese art historical um, intention. But before we proceed, we're you know, in very tight circumstances, so there's also people watching upstairs. Uh, at some point, we will take questions for Xavier and uh, a discussion will begin. So p please feel free for the people downstairs to uh, to intervene when uh, when Xavier would uh, would open the floor, and for the people upstairs, Ada will uh, be upstairs with you collecting uh, questions from you. We will give you uh, uh, paper and pencils to write your question, and the questions will also get to us. So you'll be also able to participate uh, fully in the in the discussion. So thank you very much. Uh, to everyone and uh, enjoy the performance. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before I start the performance, uh, I would like to ask you uh, two things. As the space is very small, uh, you might have problem to see certain things, so, so don't hesitate to move and raise and do what you need. It doesn't disturb me at all. Uh, and the second thing is, if you have, uh, don't, don't push too much the volume here. It's, uh, everybody's here, you here upstairs? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So the second thing I want to ask is, um, if you have questions, please wait the end of the performance to ask them. Thank you. The title of this performance I presented for the first time in 1998 is Product of Circumstances. In 1987, 
I started to work on my thesis for my PhD in molecular and cellular biology. At the same time, I began to take one dance class a week. I finished my master's degree and received a scholarship from the French government to write my thesis. The same year, I was admitted to work in a laboratory specializing in research on breast cancer and hormones. Also, the same year, I started to see a lot of dance performances during the summer festivals in the south of France where I lived. The same year was also the painful ending of a three years long love relationship. I was still playing a lot of basketball and my body was trying to get some stretch. Uh, can we change the light, please? The title of my thesis I presented in October 1990 was Study of Oncogenes Expression and Hormonal Regulation in Breast Cancer Using Quantitative In-Situ Hybridization. When I was in the laboratory, my task was to study in vivo the expression of oncogenes in breast cancer. Oncogenes are genes that, after alteration, at a structural or expressive level, have the ability of transformation and are then part of some cancer mechanisms. As we know, oncogenes can be altered by punctual mutation, genetic rearrangement, amplification, or overexpression of the oncogenes. The usual techniques used to study the RNA or protein expression are not well adapted to detect gene expression in human biopsies. So we choose to develop the technique of in-situ hybridization because this technique, with this technique it is possible to detect very low quantities of RNA expression and it's also possible, as you will see later, to localize this expression in the studied tissue. In-situ hybridization reveals the presence of messenger RNA on tissue sections by using a probe of the tested gene, which is marked by radioactivity. So after hybridization, we observe the tissue section under the microscope, and the presence of messenger RNA is visible as black dots or grains that you can see on the tissue sections when you look through the microscope. And I would like to show you some examples for this. So next slide, please. So this is the, a section of a human biopsy from a ductal invasive breast carcinoma, which was hybridized with the oncogene c -mic. And as you can see, uh, when we look at this tissue after in-situ hybridization with this uh, oncogene, we see these black dots or grains that appear on the tissue section, which, show, which shows that this uh, oncogene is expressed in this tissue. Next slide, please. Again, another section from this time a ductal breast carcinoma, not, uh, not invasive. And hybridized with the oncogene c -mic. As you can see, this oncogene is expressed in this uh, tissue also. But there are two remarks that are uh, visible on this uh, example. First, the quantity of grains that you see is much higher than the previous example, which shows how we can differentiate the level of expression of the oncogene with this technique. And second, very um, important, is that these grains appear on certain zones of the tissue, but not on others. And this shows how these techniques allows to actually localize the expression of the oncogene in the uh, tissue. So we can change the light, please. So as you could see on this um, 
example, the technique allows to localize the expression of the tested gene, and the different example shows also a clear difference in the quantity of grains. But to get the usable results from this experiment, we had to be able to translate this information into numbers for making comparative and quantitative studies of the RNA expression that we later on can use for statistic studies. So of course, it was possible to count the grain visually one by one, looking under the microscope, but this takes about two hours to count the grains in each chosen field that you observe under the microscope. So you have to imagine for this kind of study that you would maybe test six different kind of oncogenes, do this on 50 different biopsies, do for each oncogenes and each biopsy 10 times the experiment, for each experiment at least 10 fields, multiply by the number of two hours. This is enormous time. So my first task was to develop in collaboration with computer scientists from the corporation IMSTA, we developed a method for mechanically counting the level of RNA detected by in-situ hybridization on tissue sections.
To count the black dots mechanically, we use a microscope connected to a camera and a computer with a software which was developed specifically for that task. So first, we select the field from the studied tissue section under the microscope. Then we take a picture from this field with a video camera that is on top of the microscope. This picture then goes into a computer where it is digitized, and the digitized pictures appear on a video monitor where the processing of the counting can be followed. Using this technique, it takes us 10 minutes with the help of the computer to count one field observed under the microscope. So this was already much better than the two hours needed for visual counting. And it was a real progress, and these results were published, and it was the first time that I participated in a scientific publication. At that time, I was taking two or three dance classes a week and trying to learn how to do the following kind of exercises. and also this kind of things. <laughs> During this period, I spent a lot of time looking at sections of human tissues under the microscope trying to learn how to recognize the histological differences between normal and cancer cells, and also between the different types of cancers. I remember that even for the very experienced researcher, it was sometimes very difficult to make a clear and objective decision to put the observed tissue in one of the numerous existing categories. But the decisions had to be as objective as possible. And I remember that looking into the microscope, I very often had the feeling that I was both observing and transforming what I was observing. I had the feeling that my decisions were made under a certain influence. And I thought every decision actually challenged my objectivity. And I thought that I could not be actually objective. So at that time, I started to ask myself, how objective do I have to be to be able to continue to practice science, or more specifically, biomedical research? But I quickly forgot these thoughts, left them on the side, in order to be able to continue my work of research in the laboratory. So after we developed this mechanical method of quantification, we first studied the expression of oncogenes from the group of the fibroblast growth factor-like genes. We tested six different genes and oncogenes in 20 breast cancer biopsies. The level of expression of these oncogenes was very low and at the limit of detection. And actually, this work became the first subject of discord with Henri Rochefort, who was my laboratory director. We argued a lot, and I quickly found out that his experience 
and social position was much more important than any scientific argument I could give. The discussions were rarely about scientific problems or questions. It was all about career, power, and hierarchy. He wanted to publish these results, and I thought that they were not relevant enough to be published. But at the end of the day, they were published. I was learning the importance of publication and that publishing articles is the scientist's best way to create and protect his position in a society. And like researcher used to say, publish or perish. I was learning that research has to follow and use the methods of capitalism or every other name that you would like to give to the process that dominate the actual word history. And I thought I was asked to produce science, but not to search. And at that time, I took at least one dance class a day. I also did some yoga, and I began to visit an osteopath regularly. These corporal experiences laid the foundation for the necessity of new corporal corporalities and new theories about the human body. The next step of my work in the laboratory was to study the regulation in vivo of oncogenes with tamoxifen. Tamoxifen is a chemical used for breast cancer therapy because it has the ability to inhibit the effect of steroid hormones, which probably play a role in the development of breast cancer. So we studied the effect of tamoxifen on the RNA levels of four different oncogenes, CMYK, CRBB2, HST, and into two. We tested this in 19 breast cancer biopsies from patients who were treated by tamoxifen three weeks prior surgery. And we then compared the results with 22 so-called control patients who were not treated with tamoxifen prior surgery. The RNA levels were measured by in situ hybridization and with the computer-aided quantification, as I described before we found that all four oncogenes were expressed in breast epithelial cells and that the expression in the stromal tissue was negligible. And I will show you some examples for this. We can uh, change the light. And I will put this on. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, we skip this. We skip this also. Okay, so this is again um, a section of a biopsy from an invasive ductal breast carcinoma, which was hybridized with oncogene c -Mike. As you can see, this oncogene is expressed in this tissue because we have these black dots appearing on the tissue. But very remarkably here, you also can see that this expression appears on epithelial cells like here or here, but not on the stromal tissue. Next slide, please. So this is the next section coming from the same biopsies. You can recognize the form of the epithelial uh, tissue. But this time, hybridized with the oncogene CRBB2. Very evidently, this oncogene is much more expressed than c -Mic. The quantity of grain is enormous. But again, this expression is visible on the epithelial cells here or here, 
but not in the stromal tissue. Next slide, please. Here are represented the expression of the oncogene C-MIC, CRBB2, in the control population and in the population treated by tamoxifen. As you can see, we found a significant difference of expression between both population, expression much lower in the population which was treated by tamoxifen, and this with a p-value of 0.018 for C-MIC and a p-value of 0.00 three for CRBB2, so a very significant uh, result here. Next slide, please. The results for the oncogene HST and INTO2 into two were much less spectacular because these two oncogenes all have a very low level of expression in the tissue that we observed. They are part of this family of genes that I talked about earlier on. Here are represented the highest level of expression we could find in one of the uh, biopsies, which is around eight to nine grains per cell for INTO2 and for each HST. Next slide, please. Here are shown, like before, but this time for the oncogene H HST and INTO2, the expression of these oncogenes in the control population and in the population treated by tamoxifen. We could not find any significant difference of expression of these two oncogenes between the two populations. So we used all these um, results in order to look if we could find any correlation with parameters or factors that are important in the development of breast cancer. And we first look, next slide please, a possible correlation between the amplification and the expression of this oncogene in the control population and in the population treated by tamoxifen. And we found a very significant correlation in the control population for the expression and the amplification of the oncogene CRBB2 with a p-value of 0.0005, as well as a uh, correlation for the expression and amplification of the oncogene HST in the control population. We could not find any correlation between amplification and expression of all the oncogenes in the population which was treated by tamoxifen. So apparently, the regulation of this oncogene uh, can intervene at the uh, level of DNA or also at the level of RNA expression. Next slide, please. We also looked if we could find any correlation of the effect of tamoxifen on the expression of these oncogenes with the presence or absence of estrogen receptors. We found that the effect of tamoxifen on the expression of CMIC correlate in the population with an estrogen receptor with a p-value of 0.04. And very surprisingly, we found a correlation of the, um, expression, the effect of tamoxifen on the expression of CRBB2 in the population presenting no estrogen receptors, and this with a p-value of 0.02. So apparently, the regulation of these two oncogenes um, use different kind of mechanism, can go through uh, the the level of RNA and the level of the um, uh, DNA using or not the estrogen receptors. Well, we will finish here with this. Uh, we can change the, the light, please. So, as conclusion to this result, and this was also the conclusion of my thesis I presented in October 1990. The results suggest, suggest that tamoxifen in vivo decreases CMIC and CRBB2 RNA levels in breast cancer cells and has no effect on the expression of HST and INTO2. And it seems that the mechanisms of regulation of these two oncogenes by antiestrogens are different. Tamoxifen seems to be able to interfere both at the DNA and RNA levels with or without an interaction with the estrogen receptors. So to study these different mechanisms, the, uh, the approach would be to develop an experimental protocol using, for example, different lineages of breast cancer cells with different estrogen receptor status or different status of amplification for one of these oncogenes. But I had, from these three years of work in the laboratory, some other conclusions. 
and questions, such as, why do we try to give an homogeneous picture of results when they look so heterogeneous? Can we trust statistics? And what is the meaning of statistical results? In regard to statistics, I would like to quote here some material about the risks of breast cancer that were actually pointed out by Yvonne Rayner in her movie, Murder and Murder. She says that it was reported that lesbians have a two to three times higher risk of developing breast cancer than heterosexual women, which means, between other conclusions that you can make about these statistics, that when a woman comes out as a lesbian, she's more exposed to breast cancer from one day to the other by changing her relationship towards women. So, during my practice of science, I also ask myself, what is the aim in getting more and more specialized is this, for example, a way to understand the human body? It seems to me very strange to study, for example, the human body by isolating microsystems out of their context for an analysis in a laboratory environment. But this experimental system, like any other technical scientific disposition, is of course responsible for its results. It imposes the answers to problems that might be no longer about the original questions, but about their transformations. So I thought that trying to understand the cell as a microcosm of our body, it could be a very interesting model if it were not described and studied only by using, let's say, mechanistic systems that at the end of the day, try to make a myth out of it. At that time, I thought the human body is not organized only in the way that biology tries to organize it. So all these remarks may sound pretty naive, but I had the feeling that science was about understanding problems that were made up to give us the impression, and maybe also the satisfaction, of a sort of control on these questions. And I had another idealistic idea of science, but I slowly lost my belief in it. I lost this very distinguished belief specific to science, which is presented as the right of access to truth and to a different world.
These three years of work in the laboratory taught me that doing research is for 50% of the time making reports, writing articles for publications, or proving that you are actually working on a productive subject. 30% of the time is used to think about how you could be productive, and the rest of the time is for experiments, observations, and analysis. And I realized that research in biology was a lot about power and politics, and rarely about an understanding of the human body, which was actually my primary interest. So maybe my experience is very specific to biomedical research, and maybe it would have been different if I had done fundamental research in physics, for example. But it was not the case. So in 1990, after I presented my thesis, I quit my career as a molecular biologist. I escaped and I decided to do more dance. Thinking became a corporal experience and my body became simultaneously active and productive, object and subject, analyzer and analyzed, product and producer. So I went to Paris where I took more dance classes and I did more of these. <laughs> During this year in Paris, I went to auditions and I remember that one time I was refused because I was too skinny. But most of the time, I was not accepted because of my lack of technique. So I tried to practice more of these. It didn't really help. <laughs> and my enthusiasm for dance was mixed with disappointment and a feeling of exclusion. Somehow, my body was resisting the norms of dance. So maybe I was too old, or maybe there was something wrong with my body, and maybe it was this. After a year of dance classes and auditions, I finally got a job as a dancer in a company called La Compagnie de l'Alambique in Paris. We were mostly improvising to produce movements, and we were trying to express something by creating movement sequences that were supposed to answer our questions and desires. I also had to learn movement composed by the choreograph and other dancers in order to be part of what we called group dances. Most of the time, this was very difficult for me, and I will now show you an excerpt of one of these dances. Ha <laughs> ha. 
In 1992, I moved to Berlin for reasons of love. In Berlin, except for one or two groups, I found the dance scenes not very exciting, but I began to practice a little bit of contact improvisation, and I also took some Alexander Technique classes. These experiences changed a lot of my perceptions about the human body. And at the same time, after a year in Berlin, I began to work with a group called Detector. This multidisciplinary group was using as well video, text, theater, songs, dance, mixing all of them to make a performance. And working with them, I began to ask myself questions about the definition of dance and choreography. And at the same time, I was more and more disappointed by most of the performances that I saw, watching a lot of them from a lot of different groups coming from all over, I could less and less imagine working with one of these groups, companies, or choreographers. So in 1993, I began to work alone. My body became the practice of a critical necessity, and I began to use my body for questions about body images, identity, differences. I worked on creating functions and dysfunctions of the body with a quite analytical method that some people will call scientific. The first choreographies were constructed by creating links between fragments of bodies that were voluntarily taking apart, maybe as a biologist would do to analyze them, and performing this movement was about inscribing something that could be described as a go-between for mind and body and see this as a moving entity. At that time, it was for me a way to redefine the mind-body opposition and to work on the idea that just as the mind organizes the rest of the body's tissue into a life process, Sensations and perceptions, to a large degree, organize the mind. Sensations and perceptions do not simply give the mind material to organize. They are themselves a major organizing principle. But this doesn't mean that I think that dance should only be about sensations and perceptions. I don't think that choreography is reduced to handle these questions. On the opposite, I think that choreography as a much wider field of action. And since 1995, these reflections have been enriched by a collaboration with Laurent Goldrin, a friend who uh, questions the status of body pictures or human figures within the history of photography. And he was also producing video as much as text. And this collaboration helped me to continue my research, which at that time was centered on deconstructing and reconstructing my body to produce movement sequences. So I have already showed two different examples of this, which were ex extracts from a piece, which was a triptych called Narcisse Flip. And I will now show you another uh, excerpt of this piece from the third part, which was called Burke.
The first choreographies I worked on were presented during private events, which we called Pressure Presence. The first one was at the end of 1993. It was the proposition of Alexander Birndtram, a musician and musicologist friend, who suggested that we should offer each other piece of music or dance to force ourselves to find a form to present them and take them out of an exclusively personal experience. The aim was to find a direct exchange without having to engage all the dynamics of production for, from theater. And the decisions on the presentation of the piece of dance or music or anything else could be very quick, was always produced by the other, and it was producing a lot of exchange and very rich. After that, we have been invited to present some works which emerge out of this pressure presence in a couple of venues. And in 1996, I got some support from institutions from the city of Berlin, and I was also invited to be artist in residence at the Podeville, which is an art center in Berlin, was an art center in Berlin. And I started to be invited to present different works in different places in Europe. But this small success or recognition were slightly changing my way of thinking. And I noticed that somehow I was losing a certain kind of independence. I slowly noticed that the systems for dance production had created a format that influenced and sometimes to a large degree determined how a dance piece should be. I think that to a large extent, dance producers and programmers have to follow the rules of the global economy and I had integrated the economical dynamics of dance production because I wanted to be able to make a living with what I had decided to do. But even though I was very careful not to bow to that particular logic and I was trying to resist, I was not always completely convinced by my decisions. And this reminded me of some earlier experiences and made me think about the utopic and idealistic reasons that made me give up the work of research in medical biology. Somehow, my point of view and my status in the society had changed, but I found myself in a blurred field of similarities between the social and political organizations of science and dance. I felt like a fugitive who actually never escaped what he thought he was escaping. I had the need to change the way of changing, and I had the need for more critical work. But at the same time, I realized that the content of a piece was not enough for a critical position. And during the same period, around 1996, I had the luck to be invited to join Le Quatuor à Brèche Knust, which is a French dance company working on a recreation of dance pieces that have played an important role in our modernity in the West. The project was to work on the recreation of continuous project Alte Daily, a piece by Yvonne Rayner that she created in 1970. This project was very important for me and it still has a very big influence on my work. It was more than a way to access to the history of dance through the practice of it, which was already a great experience, but it also proposed a lot of answers to my questions because the project was very aware of all the aspects implied in the production of a dance piece. For example, the practice of dance in this piece questions the body and the process of work, as well as the composition methods, and everything is related to social or political questions. For example, the way of working in a group and how the responsibilities are distributed is questioned during the process of work, 
as well as during the performance. And it's always tried to challenge an established hierarchies. And it was also a lot of fun to perform. And I will now demonstrate for you two parts. The first part is called running, and the second part is called the chair and pillow dance. After this experience, it became more difficult than ever to think in terms of the production of a dance piece. Sometimes I even thought that it's impossible to do anything else. But I still have the feeling that it's a field where the questions about bodies and their representations could be explored. So after this, and since then, I have tried to work on questions such as the following. Can the production of a dance piece become the process and the production in itself without becoming a product in terms of a performance or a representation? What kind of organization do I want to use for which body, for which process of work, for which performance? Is it possible to work on all these parameters at the same time? What is performance? What is representation? Is the human body an extension of the environment or and the environment, the environment an extension of the body? And as Elizabeth Gross suggests in her book, Volatile Bodies, the human body is not a stable system or a centered organization, neither at the biological level nor at the historical, psychological or cultural levels. And she also suggests that any body image is a continuous process of production and transformation. So considering this, a perspective of work in the choreography field could be to look for ways to change the predetermined organization of the body in order to transform the form of performance and representation.
So this was the beginning of a piece called Self Unfinished that I was working on in 1998 when I was invited by Martin Spangberg, Christophe Favlet, and Hortensia Furkers to participate in an event about performance and theory. And this event was called Body Currency. I was invited because as a dancer or choreographer, my currency in a society of spectacle is to be an atypical dancer and sometimes a dancer biologist. For this event, I was asked to think about possible theoretical pathways between biology and performance. It was a very interesting challenge for me to try to make something out of this. But at the same time, it was impossible to get to an abstract and theoretical level. I could not generalize or conceptualize. I could not write a real paper or do a real lecture. So I decided to stay at a personal level and give some information about possibilities of exchange that I had experienced and give this as a support for different thoughts. I was afraid, but I took the risk of maybe being too egocentric, hoping that I could provoke some questions. And this is how I came to produce what I just presented to you this evening. And now to end this lecture, I would like to suggest that this performance was about a contaminated body in its weavings of historical, social, cultural, and biological levels being the place and time for a pathway of different thoughts that were unable to transform themselves completely into abstraction and theory. And maybe theory is biography, presenting it is a lecture, and doing a lecture is performing. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much.